Hello, I'm going to talk about embedded finance and why it creates a $7 trillion market opportunity for different players and what companies need to do to realize it. A quick introduction to myself. I'm a board and leadership advisor. I specialize in new growth strategy, platform and ecosystem strategy, and I build ventures with corporates. And I particularly focus around the topic of embedded finance and super app strategies. Uh, I work with the World Economic Forum on trying to develop new business model concepts. And I wrote a book last year called Fight Back, which is about how traditional companies can fight back against digital disruption by deploying new types of business models and, and uh, ventures. So what's the problem that we're addressing with embedded finance? Well, fundamentally, the financial system as it currently exists is just not fit for purpose. I'll give you a few examples here. Uh, we cannot, as human beings, afford to retire currently because we're living longer and we will not have enough money to allow ourselves to live comfortably into our old age, not the majority of us. And you can see this chart from the World Economic Forum recently, which shows the gap between the amount of money people need to retire comfortably and, the, and what they actually have. And the gap is today something like $30 trillion in the US alone, growing much faster than inflation. So we have a problem that we're not saving enough money. At the same time, the organizations that are meant to be supporting us with our financial life are not meeting our full needs. And interestingly, on the right here, you can see a survey done of American consumers last year, which asked people how satisfied they were with their banks. And 86% said they were very satisfied with their with their current bank, um, but at providing the services that they currently do. But only 1% of people mentioned banks as crucial to their future financial success. There's a gap between what banks and insurance companies are offering and what consumers actually need to be financially healthy. And the things that consumers were talking about, which were not being met by the current suppliers in the market, were things like how to use and manage debt, how to help them make smarter purchasing decisions, tracking progress towards desired lifestyles, planning a path to earning more household income, and developing a healthier and more effective relationship between money and happiness. And this huge gap is creating an opportunity for new companies to fill it, taking over from some of the older companies that in the past were expected to help people with their financial lives. And as you may know, something like 50 million adult Americans today are either underbanked or completely unbanked and underprotected and, and, uh, or unprotected with insurance. And we have this growing uh, gap between what people need and what they're being offered. So at one level, our financial system is just not working. On the other side, in terms of those who are trying to supply solutions to the marketplace, their old business models are out of date. And if you look at this chart, it compares the average economic profit generated by companies in 23 different uh, sectors. And this is a, a global analysis, but the principles apply in, in every country. But if you look at the average economic profit of companies within these different sectors, you can see that those operating in the financial services were doing, on average, pretty badly before COVID, before 2018. And then McKinsey looked at what that, what the trends and the acceleration in digitization, what that effect would have looking forward. And you can see that for insurance and banks, you know, it's going to get worse. And that's because digitization creates new competition. It raises uh, consumer expectations. Sometimes it creates new regulations, which, which are difficult to deal with. And, and so we have a problem 
with the companies that are trying to serve us, the business models that they have created over the last hundred years are not creating value for themselves. Economic profit is a pure measure of profit after cost of capital. It's not what they, uh, what they uh, publicly announce, and it's a purer measure of whether the decisions that leaders are making about where to allocate resources are creating a good return. Now, there are some companies that are doing extremely well and are expected to do even better uh, as digitization accelerates, and those are the software companies. And there are some, as you know, most of the big software companies are some of the biggest companies in the world, but some of the leading companies in financial services now are those that have heavily adopted software business models. And you can see some examples on the top right, and they now uh, are in the top 10 of the global financial institutions by value, whereas 10 years ago, they wouldn't have been. So the business models of the suppliers into the market are not working. The type of business models that are working best are software-based business models. But also, um, you can see that there are plenty of other sectors that are also suffering that are not super fit for the future as well. And these are non-financial service uh, sectors that are looking to work out how they add greater value to their customers and how they create a stronger economic profit. And I think Jamie Dimon, you can see on the right here, the, the CEO of JP Morgan, one of the biggest and actually one of the most successful US banks, he, he can see the future. And even though his bank is doing pretty well today, he says, I think the translation here, he is rather worried about how digitization is affecting the business models of incumbent businesses. Now, there's another problem as well. If we when as a society, we're not being able to give people what they want and the, the supply base is not making a good profit out of doing so, we've got completely new consumers who are entering the workforce um, with completely new behaviors that we who run large companies are not used to dealing with. And these are, people call them Generation Z. And you can see on the right-hand side here, the how large a proportion of the North American labor force uh, they're going to become. In five years time, it'll be 20%, three times bigger than it is today. Plus millennials that are pretty digital as well. You've got over 60% of the US labor force in, in four years time uh, that are very digitally savvy. And in 10 years time, it's gonna be even greater than that. And what these people, this cohort, this generation, uh, do is they spend a lot of time in apps and uh, it's grown enormously over the last three years in the US now it's over four hours per day spent within mobile apps and most of the mobile apps of traditional consumer companies whether they're banks insurance companies or retailers are not uh, up to scratch in terms of the way that these types of consumers want to access services and we can see on the bottom right here, the types of, of mobile experience that Generation Z uh, engages with best. And an example is the rise of TikTok, the, which is now, I think, the, most, the biggest entertainment uh, brand in the world that grew to a billion uh, users per month faster than any other uh, digital business before it. And TikTok is not just a platform for short videos, it's now integrating e-commerce, jobs, services, and others into its, into its application. So we've got these three fundamental problems. And talking about business models, we need to understand what type of business models win in this environment, what are winning today and what will win in the future. And I did some work last year with the World Economic Forum trying to define the types of business models that we use today and those which are going to be most successful in the future. And unfortunately, today, most existing businesses, whether they are in, in, in most sectors, incumbent businesses, tend to spend most of their time and effort digitizing what they already do, digitizing business models, which, as we've seen, are not delivering the value that they used to in the past. But there's a set of 
business models which are more effective. And let's just call them intelligent digital solutions. They tend to be created by startups because they're hungry, they're digitally native, um, and they're very, very good at uh, working out where gaps in the market are and how to innovate and create uh, attractive products. And uh, we talked about TikTok before, but if you look in FinTech, you can see the types of brands that are growing fast now in the US. And indeed, some traditional companies have started to make intelligent digital solutions like Marcus from Goldman Sachs, which has been very successful, or Aladdin uh, from BlackRock. So that's one type of digital business model that is effective um, to attract customers and generate value. The second type is developer platforms, those that sit between uh, developers who want to develop applications and resources and services from others. And from the uh, telecom sector, Twilio was very, very successful. And we're starting to see similar platforms emerge in financial services with Stripe and payments, Plaid with bank accounts, and Marketa, as we heard earlier on today, in terms of enabling anybody to create credit cards. So developer platforms are a, a, a very strong digital business model archetype. And then online marketplaces have been around for some time now, the classic being eBay. And then we had the wave of Airbnb and Uber. And we're starting to see online marketplaces emerge in financial services as well, like Policy Genius in insurance. But the ultimate, the most powerful type of digital business model is what we can call ecosystem orchestration, where you're doing a combination of those other things that I talked about, and you're connecting them together into a self-sustaining, coherent whole. Some people call these uh, platform, super platform business models, and many of them create super apps as part of their proposition. And I've given a few examples at the top there. That's the ultimate uh, powerful digital business model. And many of the companies that are operating in, in intelligent digital solutions or developer platforms or online marketplaces have an ambition to create a rich uh, ecosystem around themselves uh, to create sustainable growth into the future. So where does embedded finance fit in? What is it? So this is the definition I use at the moment that seems to make sense to most people. It's about abstracting financial services functionality into technology to enable any product or service provider, retailer or developer in any sector to seamlessly integrate innovative financial services into their own customer propositions and experiences. So it's like a, in, in a way, it's a type of developer platform that enables other people to create innovative financial services and support the way they interact with customers. And they can be completely invisible native components in the way that Uber makes it, you don't have to get your credit card out when you go into an Uber car, or Uber provides insurance for its drivers as part of its service. Uh, or it could be additional complementary add-ons in the way that Shopify that manages hundreds and, and thousands of small businesses on its platform provides payments and lending and insurance services to its, its users. It's, it's a complementary add-on service to a customer base, which can be very profitable. And Shopify makes about 50% of its revenue now from financial services. Uh, you've, you've seen and probably heard about Tesla integrating lending and insurance uh, into its, into its um, propositions and the big software uh, accounting platforms like Intuit QuickBooks, because it has deep understanding of its customers, is able to embed payments, lending, and insurance, and Amazon Business increasingly doing this as well. And the idea is that these non-financial service brands can improve their proposition and their customer experiences by embedding financial services and do that very easily, much quicker, cheaper and quicker and, and, and sim more simply than they could in the past before financial technology was as effective and flexible as it is today and ultimately create better experiences for their customers. Now, increasingly, 
they can combine their own data with other data sources, their own data about customers with other data sources like open banking data to create prop, uh, propositions fi around financial services, which are more attractive than the traditional suppliers like banks and insurance companies can do on their own. And they, these brands on the right, have a closer and more intimate relationship with their customers, which enables them to understand their needs potentially better than the, the traditional suppliers. And it enables customers to uh, experience um, the financial service at the point when they most need it, when it's relevant to the, in the, to the context in which they're operating, rather than having to phone up a bank or an insurance company later. So let me give you a couple of examples to, to bring this to life and the commercial benefits for the companies that are embedding financial services into their propositions. And I'll share three examples here that illustrate the, the principles. So the first is B2B software businesses. I mentioned uh, Intuit and QuickBooks before, but many other uh, vertical software businesses that support other businesses. And this is an example of a, a company that supports restaurants. And it provides an operating system and accounting package and other software to support their operations. But it's realized that because it has this very close relationship with its customers and it understands their business intimately, it's, it's capturing data on a, a real time basis about the growth and the, uh, and the operations of those businesses. It's in a much better position to offer payment services or personalized loans or insurance than a traditional uh, bank or insurance company, because it can see exactly when people might need those services in real time before they've even realized it themselves. And for the software company itself, it's creating a much greater addressable market. And in some cases, some companies like this are seeing a five X, five times the, uh, the, 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 the revenue potential uh, for them and their core business. So for B2B software businesses, very commercial, very tangible commercial benefits for nearly any type of retailer or manufacturer, big and small, uh, offering financial services, whether it's credit or insurance at the point of sale can increase the average order value by, by a considerable amount and also help to increase conversion to help people make that order rather than give up at the last minute. And the example here, you can see a very simple speaker where at the point of sale, uh, I'm offered a buy now, pay later uh, uh, um, capability, plus also insurance as well. And I can, I can choose to do that there and then. For many uh, small retailers, they make most of their money from add-on financial services, much more than the core business. So it's very attractive to them. And then if you think about the big digital platforms that that have a lot of customers that interact with them on a regular basis, they have much more intimate knowledge and understanding of those end users and are able to engage with them and educate them much better than can the traditional suppliers. And this example from China demonstrates the principle. Ant Group, which runs Alipay there, which hundreds of millions of people use for their daily shopping, um, understands its customers really well. It's able then to create a marketplace of 40 third party insurers to create much more cost effective, relevant and personalized insurance for people in China who never had insurance before because they didn't know about it. It was too complicated. It was too expensive. And by coordinating and orchestrating those resources based on understanding of customers' real needs and capability to pay, they've now brought on board 100 million people in rural China who never had any protection before. And that same principle is applicable to the United States as well. If you have 50 million people who are under or unprotected, there is a way working with people who have that much more intimate interaction with them to address that problem. So let's look at the size of the market. Um, 
And I, I did some analysis and extrapolation based on what was going on in the, in the payments world. And if we look at how new suppliers like Stripe and others are enabling other brands to, to embed payment capabilities into their proposition, um, and you look at the growth of those businesses and the proportion of total um, revenues from payment distribution and extrapolate that forward, you get to a quite a significant number, maybe 40% of the market, and this is just the US, could be facilitated by embedded um, solutions. And because these are software businesses organizing this, they have a, let's just say, give them a multiple of five times their revenues, you get to some very interesting number numbers. And if you then extrapolate worldwide, what I came to was that if you add up embedded payments, lending and insurance, and then other services like wealth management and investing, uh, you get to a market potential of 7.2 trillion, which is the value of the companies that are enabling embedded finance. And that tends to be a multiple of the revenues that go through their platforms. Now, just to put that in perspective, that this is in 10 years time, that if this is true, then you're creating new businesses which are worth double the value of the top 30 global financial institutions today and about 50% more valuable than the top 30 global software companies today. Because what's happening is that financial technology is becoming a new innovation platform on which new businesses are being created, enabling embedded finance. So many venture capitalists see financial technology being the, the fourth wave of digital progress. You had the internet, you had cloud, you had mobile technologies on which businesses were built, like Amazon, like Facebook and others. And now financial technology is the new innovation platform on which a whole explosion of innovative companies will be, will be formed. And that's really exciting. And that's why there's a huge amount of venture capital into this space currently. It's called fintech infrastructure. So I'll just try and break this down in a bit more detail and also talk about how it relates to the non-financial service companies and, and bring that to life a bit more as well. And, and look at the evolution of financial service distribution. And on the left here, you can see how it's been operating for many years. A single company, a bank or insurance company or a lender would have its own products, would do its own underwriting and it would have its own capabilities. And it would then distribute those products either directly through its own branches or sales force or through brokers and agents or partners to their customers. And their customers would buy very standard products um, that the company felt uh, were most profitable for it to create. But as we've seen before, that's no longer working. And technology is changing the landscape quite dramatically. Um, as I said, it's, it's allowing any type of financial service product or capability to be abstracted into software and allowing third party developer platforms and neo aggregators that that band in black you can see on the right here to take any type of financial service product whether it be banking payments insurance increasingly investments as well that are underwritten by anybody and match and mashing it together with capabilities to allow either it started with fintechs themselves through digital wallets to uh, make new propositions to to customers but increasingly any company whether it's a traditional retailer or it's a utility or it's a manufacturer or it's a brand in any sector and a, a trade association to take any type of financial service product, package it up and make it available through a digital wallet to customers. And these, because the, the, the brands and the fintechs and the big techs understand their customers uh, well, because they have daily interactions with them, they are more able to design with the help of the developer platforms, more 
compelling solutions which are integrated into the daily lives of consumers. And that essentially is the essence of embedded finance. And you can see that a lot of technical development has enabled this, a lot of new things that have become mature now, which are creating this explosion that leads to those, uh, those numbers I showed you just now. So I'm going to let's just take an example around bank as a service. Um, and we could talk a lot about insurance and uh, investment as a service as well. But if we're just thinking about banking as a service, um, you can see the, the structure here. You have general brands at the top. You have the emergence of fintech brands, developer platforms, as I've talked about. And then in the US, sponsor banks, uh, which through some um, regulatory changes over the last uh, 10 or so years, um, have enabled small banks to make to essentially license their their capabilities to the developer platforms who then create solutions related to uh, financial services starting with payments and then also bank accounts which fintech brands have then used to create their um, their propositions and now we see the entrance of general brands wanting to do more with this and the key point here is to say that the whereas the supply side of this equation was stronger maybe uh, a few years ago as the demand side has become uh, more expert at uh, exploiting financial services then they become stronger as the market matures they are they are the ones at the top with the customer affinity um, the fintech brands themselves are now, there's now a plethora of suppliers providing fintech infrastructure funded by venture capital. And so those operating developer platforms need to do a lot more than provide high quality APIs. We're seeing them uh, offering operational support, even um, managed services to source the supply of, of financial services as well rather than just relying on uh, one or two partners. And so the whole market is changing quite quickly now to the benefit, I would say, of consumers and a creating a huge opportunity for general brands across all sectors to, to get involved in this. And let's just think of a, an example from, uh, from the banking side of who's responding best from the incumbents. We've seen all the innovation uh, with the with startups and fintechs and uh, and companies like Square and others, um, but one of the leading companies in the U.S. on the banking side is Goldman Sachs, who really made a big shift recently when they said that developers are our customers, and that was a major major shift in attitude by a, a, a very old uh, incumbent banking institution. And I, I haven't seen quite that, um, that attitude shift from many banks around the world, but it's, a, it's a certainly a breath of fresh air to hear Goldman talk about this. And essentially, they've created their own bank as a service, you could call it embedded finance platform, uh, that enables them to support new brands that want to embed financial services into their propositions. And one of their early customers was Apple Pay. Now, by doing that, they create a huge new customer base that then, through them, um, creates new customers for their core business, either transaction services or Marcus, their, their retail bank. So it's a clever strategy to engage developers at third party brands with, to in, embed financial services into their propositions. They generate new customers and they drive customers for their other businesses as well, creating a lot of synergy between what they're doing. So let me just end now with the, the five, um, well, nine key success factors, not just for banks or insurance companies, but for any organization uh, looking into this space, whether they're brands, retailers, very advanced tech co's, or small companies of any size. Uh, the nine key things that people need to bear in mind are these. Th this is a, a, such an interesting and um, innovative space that every company needs a strategy um, to take advantage of 
embedded finance and they need a clear vision for that it's not one solution won't be enough they need to create a rich portfolio and they need new ways of looking at what customers really want they need to apply the discipline of the startups and the fintechs which are really good at understanding and spotting unmet needs in the market uh, and to think about new types of commercial models to support them the old ways of doing business in terms of how they make profit are not going to be uh, successful in this world it's critical that you create a separate space in which you can do innovation in this space trying to innovate from within the core business is almost always a recipe for disaster and you need to ring fence enough investment to make it effective and then you need new methods to scale up your activity the old ways of, of working of doing a lot of market analysis and then trying to launch a product are not are not going to work you need new lean innovation methods and to create core enablers to create synergies between your core business and the new business and what i find works really well is when you make it tangible this is a really good way of engaging with the people um, who run the core business to show them that if we do invest in new revenues from embedded finance it will increase the overall um, growth of our company uh, and having that discussion with those who run the traditional business is very effective particularly if you can show how the embedded finance activity will also drive demand for the core but the number one foundational requirement to win in this space is an ambidextrous organization. I touched on it just now, but it is so fundamental. I'm, I'm drawing it out as my, my last slide here. Uh, for any company, whether it is a retailer, whether it is a bank, an insurer, or a utility, or a manufacturer, or any type of business, when you're creating a new business model, which embedded finance is, it cannot be done from within the core. It, you need to create a separate space in which you can fast track the future, which is run by different people with different metrics and different incentives. Now, critically, you need to connect that to the core business to demonstrate how that drives value to the core. But you need to create a separate space, particularly in embedded finance, as there are often regulatory risks and challenges. Um, which means that you want to also create a separate space for it. But overall, I would say whether any type of, co whatever company you are, that is the critical starting point or the critical enabler for you to be successful here. And of course, you need to work out where to play and how to win. And there are many different methods of execution now which are effective, particularly creating uh, ventures. So I hope that's been interesting and useful and stimulating. And thank you very much for, for listening to me today. And do stay around on the strategy stage where there'll be more talks on this topic. Thanks very much.